My team helped this active duty service member have three VA loans in three years. And in this video, I'm going to show you exactly how you can do the very same thing. I'm going to reveal the strategy. I'm going to tell you what you need to know to qualify. So that way, if you want to embark on this journey, you can do it as well. If you don't know who I am, my name is Josh and I created this VA loan tips channel to educate veterans, service members, and real estate professionals around everything that they need to know about the VA home loan benefit. So if you want to stay up to date in regards to all of the things that go into to this very unique VA loan, subscribe and join the community. Now, before I can even show you how this was even possible, we need to discuss a couple of things in regards to the VA's rules and requirements. In the VA handbook, it states that the veteran must intend to occupy the property as their primary residence for one year. At the end of that one year, they can convert the property into a rental and move on to purchase another property with the VA home loan benefit. Now, how that part is gonna be possible we're gonna talk a little bit more about next. But in regards to occupancy requirement, the reason I wanted to bring this up to you guys is because if you look at his COE, you'll notice that in that middle section where it says date of loan, it's gonna show you that he purchased two properties in 2021. Well, you just heard me say that the VA said you need to occupy the property for one year. So how did he buy two properties with his VA loan in, in less than one year, really in even less than six months? How was this even doable? Is this even legal? Well, what most people wouldn't understand here is the orders that a active service member receives after they close on their home supersede the VA's mortgage requirement. What does this mean? Well, when we helped him buy that property, he had actually bought a duplex at that duty station that he was located at. And his intention was to live in one of the units and rent out the other unit. Well, about two weeks after he closed on that duplex, he found out he was going to be PCSing in about five months to a whole other duty station, which means that he can now rent out the unit he was going to be occupying and purchase again at his next duty station because he did not have those orders prior to his purchase of that property. So he rented out that other side or that unit he was living in, and he went and purchased another property with his VA loan at his next duty station. Fast forward about a year and a half later, we helped him purchase another property at a whole other duty station after PCSing once again. And when I was getting ready to prepare for this video, me, he, me and him had a good conversation just catching up, talking about that journey. And he just told me that he was actually getting ready to PCS once again to a whole other duty station in which, depending on how much entitlement he has left over, if he wanted to buy another house this VA home loan benefit, he technically could use his VA loan again. But we're not going to talk about that in this video. We're going to talk about how achieving and having three VA loans is even possible. Now that you know the VA's occupancy requirement, we need to talk about the VA's conforming and county loan limits. The county loan limits for the VA are set by the FHFA, the Federal Housing Finance Agency, and they create what are called conforming loan limits that are also used on conventional loans as well. Now, these conforming loan limits are set, again, based on county. So when you are using your VA loan and intending to have multiple VA loans at the same time, we need to look at the county loan limit in the location that you are going to be purchasing the second property. What we would do is we would go and look at this map here, and they even have it listed off as well in a giant list Rolodex, but this map shows us the conforming loan limits for 2024. As you'll see in gray, that's going to be the minimum conforming or county loan limit, and the minimum is $766,550. $766,550 in really over 95, maybe maybe even 97% of the United States is going to use that minimum amount. But you'll see some areas are in yellow, light orange and dark orange. Those areas are considered what are called high cost or higher cost areas. And those can be anywhere between $766,551 to up to $1.1 million as far as the county loan limit. And that's simply because in those areas, the cost of homes are going to be significantly higher than these other areas that follow the minimum amount. So if you're in a high cost area, you could see your county loan limit being higher. 
If you want to know what your personal county loan limit is, I need you to do me a favor, comment below. But when you comment below, you need to make sure you tell me the county that you are in, not the city. Because if you tell me the city, I won't be able to search this list because it doesn't go based off of city. It goes off of county. So make sure you comment below the county that you're in and I'll comment back to you and let you know exactly what your county loan limit is for 2024. Now, another reason why these county loan limits are important to understand is because these change every single year. If you go back just to over the last five years, we have seen a $250,000 increase in county loan limits. In 2020, the county loan limit was $510,400. From 2020, in 2021, it went to 548. 2022, we saw a pretty big jump. It went from 548 to 647, almost a $100,000 increase. And then it jumped again in 2023 to 726. And then now in 2024, it is 766,000, which means that depending on what year you bought that first property, if you were to calculate how much entitlement you had left over in that same year, based on that county loan limit, you probably are thinking you don't have enough left. So that's another thing to understand about this whole strategy is that over time, the county loan limit traditionally continues to rise, which means that you will potentially have more entitlement available to you when buying the next property as time goes on. Now that we've gotten the understanding for how county loan limits work, we need to also understand when they matter. Now, I told you guys they matter based on where you're buying when you're buying that next property, but what a lot of veterans don't know is county loan limits actually only matter when you are trying to have multiple VA loans. So let's say you are a veteran or active duty service member and you have never purchased any properties using your VA loan before. Technically, did you know that you do not have a county loan limit? Yes, no matter where you are located, even though I just showed you that map, you do not have a county loan limit right now. Because in January 1st of 2020, the VA created what's called the Blue Water Act, which states that if a veteran has 100% of their entitlement available, they are actually exempt from having to follow a county loan limit. They could purchase up to whatever they can income and credit qualify for. So if you want to buy a two, three, four million dollar property with your VA loan, you can do that at no down payment, 100% financing, no private mortgage insurance, just like any other VA loan. This is extremely powerful because it created an opportunity for veterans to use the VA loan to buy luxury property. Now, you still have to income and credit qualify for that property, but it is a very powerful opportunity for a veteran that wants to, again, buy luxury property. But that's for a whole other video. This video is about how to have multiple VA loans at the very same time. Now, let's jump over to a certificate of eligibility for another veteran that has two VA loans and wants to purchase a third property. I'm going to calculate their remaining entitlement just to give you guys an example of how the calculation works. So I, here's that COE. And this veteran has a property in Texas and a property in Louisiana. And just for the sake of this example, let's say that they're going to buy instead of in one of the minimum amounts, I'm going to use one of the medium to high cost areas. So let's come up here to let's do Seattle, Washington. Seattle, Washington is their county loan limit is 977 500. I'm going to go back to that veteran COE. And what we now need to do is put our county loan limit, 977, 500, right? And we need to divide it by four. And the reason for that is because right here, you'll see it says 25%. That means that we need to use a 25% breakdown to be able to factor in the amount of entitlement charge because the VA does not want us to do this calculation based on loan limit. They want us to do it based on entitlement charge. And so this is going to be the proper way to do this calculation. So if you divide it by four, it brings us to 244,375. We now need to subtract this total amount of entitlement charge, which is the really the sum of these two numbers right here, which would be 107,434. That's 136,941. But now we've only got 25% of what they have left. So now we need to multiply it by four to get the final number. The final number shows us that this veteran would have 547,000 available to purchase property number three in Seattle, Washington. Now the same calculation would apply if this if this veteran was like, you know what? I actually I'm I'm PCSing to Honolulu, Hawaii, which is 1.149825. So we would go back to that COE, we would bring up our 
little calculator, 1149825. We now need to divide it by 4, and then we need to subtract the 107,434, and now we multiply it by 4. This veteran has 720000 available to purchase that third property in Honolulu, Hawaii. That's how the calculation works for factoring in your second tier entitlement. The next thing that I want to talk to you guys about is going to be qualifying for all of this. When it comes to qualifying for your second VA loan, what the lender is going to do is use a very similar style of calculating your liabilities as they did on the first property you bought. The only difference is another liability is going to show up and that's going to be the mortgage on the first property you bought. You see the lender is looking at your credit, your income, your assets, and your liabilities. Credit, income, assets, liabilities. Those are the main four things that the lender is looking at. Now, when you bought the first property, you more than likely didn't have a mortgage or any liability for a mortgage there, So, but now you do. So what happens, right? Do you qualify for significantly less? Not necessarily. What the VA guideline actually states is you can actually offset your mortgage payment with rental income for a property that you haven't even rented out yet. It's a very powerful strategy here, and it allows you to offset up to 100% of this. Not all lenders follow this guideline. I know some that only will give you 75%, but in the VA handbook, it does state you can offset 100% of it, and this is what you would need to do. Let's say your property's mortgage payment is $2,500, and based on fair market rent, you can rent it out for $3,000. That means you're gaining $500 extra over your mortgage payment. Now, I'm not saying that this is going to happen or guaranteeing anything to you guys, but this could happen, and I've seen it happen, where a veteran's mortgage payment is less than what they could receive in rent. What we would do is we would get what's called a rental market analysis to support that rents in that area support that amount that you're getting there. And then what we can do is take up to your mortgage payment and offset it against that liability. So now it basically washes itself clean. We can't give you the extra 500 bucks in income, but we can give you whatever amount is available to offset. So essentially, it can only go up to whatever your mortgage payment is to do that departing residence rule is what it will do for you. So now, the only liabilities that you're going to have is going to be for those other things other than your mortgage or your property expenses. If the rental income is lower or the projected rental income is lower than your mortgage payment, well then you're only going to have to qualify as far as the remainder of that liability of the difference. So let's say your mortgage payment is $2,500. You're only able to rent it out for $2,200. Well, now you only have about a $300 gap, which is a lot better than having a $2,500 gap to try to qualify for property number two. Now, when it comes to property number three, this is where it gets a little bit tricky. When it comes to property number three, you got to remember property number one's already been rented out for at least a year, which means that it's more than likely should already be on your taxes and factored in in regards to your rental income on the tax return. The lender has to use the tax return, specifically that schedule, to determine what amount of rental income they can give you. They cannot use that same departing residence rule for that property like I was just showing you there. That rule would be used on the second property because you're now moving from property number two to property number three, right? So they can use the departing residence rule on the property that you are departing. They can't do it on a property that is already a rental. A property that is already a rental, we would have to use the tax returns to determine that rental income. So that's the only way you're going to see a, a difference there in regards to the qualifying standards. Now, you remember I told you that the occupancy requirements were one year? Personally, even though you can and only need to occupy the property for one year, I actually am not the biggest fan of a veteran buying a property every single year. I actually think that doing it after living in the property for two years is going to be the most advantageous. And the reason for that is because sometimes when you buy real estate with the thought of, let's say, buying it for long-term use, meaning you're going to own this property for as many years as you possibly can, whether you live in it or rent it out, sometimes things change. Just like sometimes buying a property with the intention, if you're a real estate investor that flips homes, maybe something changes during the time of that flip and you decide that it's going to be a long-term property. The whole point in all this is you want to try to have as many op options available to you to be able to pivot if you need to. So the reason I like veterans to live in a property for two years as their primary residence is simply 
for IRS's capital gains. You see, if you live in a property for two out of the last five years and you decide to sell that property, you are exempt from capital gains tax up to 250000 if you are single or 500000 if you are married filing jointly. This is a very powerful thing here because let's say in that five-year range of you owning your property or even less, because you lived in that property for two out of the last five years and something changes in your situation and you now decide you want to sell that property for whatever reason, you now create a lot of opportunity for yourself to not have to pay capital gains tax on the amount of money that you would gain from the equity that you would have in that property over the course of those five years. Now, again, I know this video is about owning multiple VA loans and having as many VA loans as you possibly can, but I wanna be very transparent with you guys on what I think is a really smart strategy because again, things change and you might wanna be able to pivot. Let's talk some more strategy here. If you are buying property with the intention of making it a rental, whether that's year two, year three, whenever it is that you decide to do this, I want you to think like a real estate investor and not just a home buyer. Because a home buyer is thinking more about home. This is going to be more than just a roof. This is a place that they want to lay roots and be for quite a long time. But if your intention is to make it a rental, think like a landlord, which means don't pick a property that you just absolutely love that fits all of your needs and is something that's hard for you to walk away from because chances are you're probably not going to want to do that which also means you don't want to go and make a bunch of uh, upgrades to the property, improvements, and all these different add-ons to a house that really make it unique to you because then what's going to end up happening is your your tenant is going to be the ones enjoying that all those things that you did for that property for you. And you, chances are you don't want that because just because you make an update or an improvement to a property does not always lead to a dollar-for-dollar dollar increase in rental income. A lot of times, most improvements and upgrades that are made to a property don't always equate to those to those increases. Sometimes they actually create a liability. And I'm sharing this with you guys so openly because I personally have made that mistake and I definitely don't want to see other people do it. Another thing I would highly advise you guys to do is figure out how you are going to manage all of this. If you're going to own real estate, you need to understand your landlord laws in the state that you were in. You need to understand how leases work. You need to understand how much you're going to receive in rental income based on fair market rent in your area for similar homes. If you're gonna manage this property yourself, those are all things you need to understand because you could find yourself getting into some trouble. If you're going to hire a property manager, that's fine too, but you need to start vetting someone well before it's time to rent that property, which means that if you know that you're gonna rent a property out in the next six months, I would highly advise you to look into finding a good property manager that you know, like, and trust now, not later. Do not wait until you're ready to move out of that house. Do it well before so that you can build a relationship with that person because you're about to trust that person with pretty much your most valuable asset. So you want to have a good, solid working relationship with that person. Another thing I highly advise veterans to do is to set aside a rainy day or reserve fund which means that you want to have a separate account that is solely for every property you own, a completely different bank account that is only going to entail any transactions and all your rental income, any incoming and outbounding funds that are for that property in that account. If you own three properties, you need three separate accounts that are separate from your other funds. In those accounts, you want to also have the reserve and rainy day fund that I was mentioning. So if your property's expenses are, let's say, $2,500 every single month, you want to have at least three months of reserves or rainy day funds. So that's $7,500. If you can get to six months or more, that's going to be the most ideal. But I would say at least three months because there could be a potential for having vacancies. You may have to evict somebody. You may have to have repairs done on your property. That's going to be money that's set aside to be able to ha allow you to not have to stress about how you're going to make your mortgage payment or fix your property in the event something does potentially happen. So there you have it. How to have not only two VA loans, but how to have three at the very same time and use your VA loan to build generational wealth. If you want to learn how to house hack your VA loan, check out this video right here. And if you want to see my VA loan buyer's guide, check out this video right here. Before I let you guys go, I want you guys to know one thing. Jesus loves you and he paid a price for your life. I'll see you in the next one.